Recording, go ahead. Uh, we're here today, October 30th, 2015, at the Institute for Policy Studies in Washington, D.C., to interview William Blum, author, historian, and U.S. foreign policy critic. For the last five decades, Bill has been one of the leading voices on the left in opposing U.S. militarism and imperialism, starting with his opposition to the U.S. war in Vietnam, which began even as he was pursuing a career with the U.S. State Department. Our interview will concentrate on Bill's activism in the District of Columbia in the 1960s and early 1970s. We're filming this interview for the Lessons of the 60s Project, a local D.C. oral history project of the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, I'm John Hanrahan, uh, with me is Ann Gallivan, and on camera is uh, Eddie Becker. And first, a little background on our interviewee, uh, Brooklyn native uh, William Blum started out as a pretty conventional young person in the 50s and early 60s, moving from jobs in the corporate world to the State Department, where he aspired to become a Foreign Service Officer. As the U.S. escalated the war in Vietnam, Bill, in early 1967, left the State Department after a uh, little more than two years there to express his opposition to the war and become one of the founders and editors of the Washington Free Press, something we'll hear a lot about in the interview. <clears throat> Bill has been a freelance journalist in the United States, Europe, and South America. His stay in Chile in 1972-73, writing about the Allende government's socialist experiment and its tragic overthrow on a CIA-designed coup, instilled in him a personal involvement and even more heightened interest in what his government was doing in various parts of the world. And I believe you mainly walked to Chile and took buses to... Oh, get bus, there. yeah. Uh, in the mid-70s, he worked in London with former CIA officer Philip Agee and the associates and uh, his associates on their project of exposing CIA personnel and their misdeeds. Among his many books, uh, Bill's book on U.S. foreign policy, Killing Hope, U.S. Military and CIA Interventions Since World War II, first published in 1995 and updated since, has received international acclaim. Noam Chomsky called it far and away the best book on the topic. Bill specializes in reminding people of our nation's forgotten or hidden history. As a prime example, in 1999, he was one of the recipients of Project Censored's awards for exemplary journalism for writing one of the top 10 censored stories of 1988, an article on how in the 1980s, the United States gave Iraq the material to develop a chemical and biological warfare capability. Uh, he's also the author of America's Deadliest Export, Democracy, uh, The Truth About U.S. Foreign Policy and Everything Else, uh, Rogue State, A Guide to the World's Only Superpower, updated edition 2005, West Block Dissident, A Cold War Memoir, 2002, which we'll draw heavily from today, and Freeing the World to Death, Essays on the American Empire. His books have been translated into more than 15 languages. Uh, in January 2006, a tape from Osama bin Laden stated that, quote, it would be useful, unquote, for Americans to read Rogue State, apparently to gain a better understanding of their enemy and U.S. Uh, aggression in the world. This unsolicited endorsement spurred a big jump in the book's sales. You won't see Bill on Charlie Rose or the Sunday political talk shows, no surprise there. But he does appear uh, as a, a guest commentator on RT and various other programs with a uh, left point of view, which is so seldom heard in the media. So welcome, Bill, and let's get started with the uh, Thank you. questions here. Um, briefly, uh, where did you grow up, uh, go to college, family, etc.? I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and I went to City College of New York, which is now part of City University. And my first profession was as an accountant. Uh, and my second profession was as a computer programmer. I spent four years with IBM mm -hmm. uh, in, in New York. Mm -hmm. And I also taught English as a second language uh, in, in Los Angeles for uh, uh, many years. Mm -hmm. But then I finally turned to writing, and that's where I've been for the past 35 years or so. Mm -hmm. So uh, when did you um, come to uh, Washington, and what were the circumstances of that? What is I came to Washington from New York in 64, in, uh, 
to take a job as a, a computer programmer. Uh, but uh, in the first year I was in Washington, I changed my head completely. That was with the State Department? That no, no, that was with, with the, uh, some think tank. In ah, okay. Some think tank in, in D.C. But some, for some reason, I decided I wanted to be a Foreign Service officer. And I applied to, to the State Department. And after a long wait, I was accepted. And I began working there as, as, a, as a programmer, just biding my time until I could take the Foreign Service exam. Mm -hmm. But then, before I could take the exam, something came along called the Vietnam. And that changed my, my mind and my life completely forever. Mm -hmm. Up until then, I think as you relate in your book, you had held pretty basic... I was a... Before then, I was a liberal Democratic Party uh, supporter. I, I campaigned for Adlai Stevenson and, and for people like that. Uh, so, pretty standard stuff. But the war of Vietnam changed my mind completely. I just... But each day I would read the news, mm -hmm. uh, story after story of the horror, and I couldn't believe that, that, that this was my government doing that. And slowly but surely, it sunk in. This was my government. Mm -hmm. and, but even before, I, even before this, I had volunteered at the Washington Peace Center. Uh, and just to express my interest in, in foreign affairs, but I still was not about any kind of leftist. And one, one day, the, the guy who ran the, the Peace Center, he asked me if I'd like to hand out some flyers in front of the White House. And I thought, oh my God, is he crazy? I, I work for the State Department. How can I be standing in front of the White House handing out flyers? And, and I gave him some excuse why I couldn't do it. And then a few weeks later, he asked me again. And I said, okay, this time. And I went to the White House. Uh, I took off from my work at the State Department, and I was sitting in front. Of, and my, my biggest fear was that someone who knew me at, at the office would pass by and see me. And I, it was a, a very scary situation. Uh, but I, I was there for a few hours, and then some guy turned up. He had been handing out the same flyer I was about a block away, and he came by and he saw me. And we began to talk, and uh, he invited me to go to a discussion group, that, which now we would call a a Marxist study group. But I didn't know I didn't know it was that. I'm not sure I'm not sure what I would have done if I had known that. But I I went to that meeting, and that was the beginning of the end, uh, and. I, 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 in, in those meetings, I was definitely the outsider. I was not, they were all the radicals and I was not. Mm -hmm. And I, I even argued with them. Uh, but slowly but surely, over the course of a few months, mm -hmm. they, 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 they put no pressure on me at all. Mm -hmm. they, they, were not, they were very unobvious uh, about it. They just let me talk and, 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 then, I, and then I listened and I began to read things I hadn't read before, and eventually I moved in, in their direction. Uh, it was inevitable. Mm -hmm. Did they know at that time you worked for the State Department? Yeah. And they didn't... I, I thought, when I, when I first told them, I thought, oh, this is going to blow their minds, you know. Mm -hmm. But they, they couldn't care less. This, this was Washington. You had to work somewhere in Washington. Everybody, half the people there had a job in the government. So, it was, it was no big deal that I worked at the State mm -hmm. Department. <laughs> so uh, what I thought would be a, a coup d'etat on my part would, was a big nothing. Uh, and so anyhow, eventually I became w one of them and I left the State Department. And, and then I and some of those people in that group, we formed the Washington Committee to End the War in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. This was the first such group in D.C. And it was part of a, a nationwide movement. Uh, the Washington Committee, the, the Committee to End the War in Vietnam, headquarters in the Midwest somewhere. Uh, 
and they had a branch in, in every big city. And I and, and some other people in, in this group formed the Washington, D.C. Uh, branch. Did, did you uh, start that, though, even before you left the State Department? Were you involved in that, I should say? I was involved with this group before I left the State Department. Uh, and as I mentioned, I was, I was in front of the White House handing out oh, yeah, leaflet, yeah. leaflets. So I was doing quite a few things uh, which I shouldn't have been doing. Uh, and I knew, I knew someone must be watching me. I, even, even this is long before NSA and, and what's his name? Uh, I knew, I, I, eventually I was called in by, by, by the security department and they sat me down and they had my file on the desk and they opened it up and turned page by page and, and, and with each page they, they told me who I knew, which meetings I had gone to, where I had lived, you know, page after page and I just sat there listening and finally they said, they suggested I would be happier, happier in, in the private sector, <laughs> uh, which I couldn't argue with. I mean, they, they were, they, I must say they were fairly decent about it. It was not, it was not, it was not exactly uh, Guantanamo. <laughs> uh, it was fairly civilized, and, and, was, and, and so I, I knew when I left that meeting that, that was it. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I quit very soon afterwards. So, and uh, at that point that you quit, uh, did you have any inkling as to what you would hope to be doing? Well, I didn't quit because of, of any, other, any future plans, right. but I had been working Shortly before that point, I had been working with some people who were forming a newspaper, the Washington Free Press, and uh, whom I had, I had met them through a, a, my, a girlfriend of mine. And so as soon as I, I left the State Department on a Friday, and on Monday I went to work full time at the Free Press. And, and that's, that's how I began writing. I hadn't been, I had ambitions to write, but who, who doesn't? Mm -hmm. uh, this was the first time that I did it with any kind of seriousness, mm -hmm. and uh, I really loved. I was I was trying to be funny, very funny in in the paper, uh, and I had full freedom to write what I wanted. My, my first article in the Free Press was my life at the State Department, uh, which was seen by people uh, people who also had been at the State Department, and, and they they contacted me. Mm -hmm. So that's how I began writing. Now, and when you did this, uh, when you left the State Department, it wasn't like you were just somebody out of college. You were already in your... I was past 30. Yeah. I was 32 or so. Yeah. And... Was, and but I, I had savings. I, I had... Uh -huh. Working as, as, as a, uh, a programmer for, for mm -hmm. about seven years, I had saved, saved quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. So I didn't... I, that wasn't a worry. I could live on my savings for a long time. I knew that. So, uh, what, just give us some of the atmosphere of the, the free press, where it was located, who were some of the people there. I know you talked in the book about people who, some who said grammar and, and yeah, it, matter. I was <laughs> the only, I was the most serious writer amongst them. There were, there were eight of us who, who, who founded the, the paper, uh, eight of us. Uh, I could even name all eight pe people, I think, but that's not important. Uh, Tell us some yeah, of the people. Yeah. Sure. Well, there was Frank Speltz, you, you know his name? And his wife, Ann Speltz, and uh, Art Grossman, whom Eddie knows, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Frank Speltz's wife, yeah, yeah, did I mention Ann Speltz? And. There was a Grossman with two S's. There were two Grossmans. Yeah. Art Grossman and Mike Grossman, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Mike Roseman and I didn't get along too well. He was the one who objected to any kind of g grammar improvement in the paper, and, and he put it on, on the blackboard, uh, grammar is bourgeois, something like that. Uh, so, but I, but I, I took pains to make, to make it uh, readable. Uh, um, and we had a, a small army of young, of young hippies who would sell the paper it was their main income. They would come by once a week and pick up a big supply of papers. They, they would pay us 10 cents for each issue and they would sell it for 25 cents. Mm -hmm. So for them it was a nice amount of money. 
Do you, do you remember what, uh, I know each issue was different, but what your biggest circulation was uh, at any one time? Oh, the, the, the how amount? Many how many papers oh. you might have sold in, typically in a... In a yeah, yeah, it's been so long. Um, no, it was just, and you were located... Where well, were you? The, well, the first office was on uh, Q Street between 17th and 18th. That was a, a, a house which we, we rented the house, and, and the whole staff lived in that house except me. I had my own apartment. I, 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 was, I was running more than any, with any money. I, I had my own apartment uh, not far away, but they, they, the whole staff lived in this house, and uh, they ate their meals there. Uh, it was a very close period for, for all of us. It was very nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had never had any experience with sharing a house or, or living with hippies and <laughs> it was the whole thing was all new to me mm -hmm. it's amazing that I, I how this came came about since we don't have a copy right here what what was a typical issue like what were some of the features, uh, uh, it was well it had a lot to do with the anti-war movement of course mm -hmm. and with dope uh, uh, marijuana and, and, and acid Mm -hmm. And I guess some civil, civil liberties, civil rights stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, some reviews of, of films or theater and, mm -hmm. uh, and some uh, 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 much hippie stuff. It was not making too much sense, frankly. Mm -hmm. uh, just we... we some of the staff had the attitude that if, if a person writes, writes something, even if it's written very poorly and maybe even if it's stupid, we have no right to change what he, he's written because it's his, it's his right as a writer. And I thought that was just absurd. Why, why put it out a newspaper if you're not going to edit anyone, you know? I mean, it really was stupid. And I, I was one who pushed for editing, things like, things like that. But a few stories, always, every issue, there was always a few stories about some hippie, some stoned hippie, and who was just venting his subconscious. Mm -hmm. I didn't care for that too much. Uh -huh. uh, and, I, and I also did, a, 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 each week, it was a weekly newspaper, and I did a weekly calendar of events on the back page, which I, t I, took, I took much pride in. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I made many contacts in the city for all kinds of events, and it was all in this calendar, plus my, my humor. I put, him, put him a lot of humorous things in the, into that calendar. Like I would say there's going to be some, some meeting at the White House, which was, which was a phony story and things like that. Uh, but it was, it was great fun, and it, it, was, it was very much appreciated. It's, that was one of the main reasons people bought the paper. They, 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 we heard this again and again, the part that was going on in the city. It was a great time to be here. I mean, there were so many things going on. And uh, there was always plenty of stuff to publicize. Mm -hmm. the, um, it, at that time, uh, one of the, uh, you had your own apartment, other people were living communally. Yeah. Um, what, it, was, it was very cheap though even to have your own apartment if you had some sort of income behind. Even yeah, I think my, my, my rent must have been about uh, $80 a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I can, that was, for me that was nothing. And, and living in this, I know I saw reference in the book that you came under all sorts of scrutiny, some of it just bureaucratic kind of scrutiny from the, the city, but also then from the intelligence. You mean the, 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 the paper, you mean? Yeah, the paper, yeah. Oh, the, yeah, the paper. Yeah. They, they were watching us in many ways. And they, they sent people to uh, harass us a lot. Someone started a fire in, in, our, in, in the hallway of, of our building. Uh, and they, 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 the FBI invaded one time, and and this was just before a major demo in Washington, an anti-war demo, and the FBI took a bunch of cards, which we were sending out to people, asking them if they could put up people coming in from out of town to attend the the demo. The FBI took a bunch of these cards and filled them out with phony names and addresses. And, and just to cause confusion, this is, this is how, how, how low life they were. Mm -hmm. they, they still are, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, they just, just, just to cause us a headache. And we, we had so many headaches. 
but from things like that. Uh, and they also, the, the police uh, um, arrested many of our vendors uh, again and again, and it was very, very hard. We, and we had to uh, pay a fine for them, and we couldn't afford for that. But that's just the way they slowly squeezed a small amount of money out of us, you know. Uh, they had no, no, no pity at all on us. Uh, we had one big advertiser in the paper, Columbia Records, and, and a full page ad. Uh, it was a nice amount of money. And the FBI went to Columbia and told them to stop advertising with us, which they did. Mm -hmm. you know, freedom of the press was, was great. Uh, and and we, had, we had a big problem with, with printers. They, they would cancel. After, after they, they printed a few issues, they would cancel it. Sometimes because of their own employees. Their own employees objected to and they can't. We finally had run out of all the ones in D.C. And we had to go to Long Island every week to get the paper printed. You know, after, after being up all night long doing the layout, we had to have staff driving to, to New York to, to, to a printer. Was there, um, you mentioned about the fire in the FBI. Was there also a break-in, uh, suspicious, uh, or maybe not the break-in at the office, too? Or is, this, is that what you were referring to at the... The, the FBI. Well, they, 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 they took out, they took these cards. Yeah, so that was the And this was, uh, this story was actually in the New York Times. Seymour Hirsch reported on it, on, on this story, how the FBI broke it and, and took and stole these cards. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, uh, tell us about the uh, photographing of the CIA. Uh, employees' license plates, uh, caper. Oh, well, this didn't happen with the free press. After oh, it didn't? Oh. This happened with the Quicksilver Times oh, okay. uh, in, in 1969. Okay. Yeah. You just tell us about it. Yeah, yeah, this, yeah. This, yeah. this happened with, uh, with a guy named Sal, Sal Ferreira, Salvatore Ferreira, who he had become a, good, a close friend of mine, and he, he came up with the idea of parking a car outside of CIA headquarters and copying down the license plates numbers of people going into the, into the CIA. And then we, we, did, we did that. We, we were there for a couple of hours. With, we got, we got, and he would, he would read, in, read the name, the, the tag numbers into a microphone uh, and it was recorded. And then after this was over, we went to the DMV offices in, in D.C., Virginia, and Maryland and got hundreds of names and addresses and matching these tag numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, th th it was, things were much more open in those days. You, today, you, you couldn't do that today. Uh, At the CIA, uh, I think you, you were using some sort of ruse to, like you had to make Well, the, I, the car was parked on the, on the, high, on the, ro on the road uh, leading into CIA headquarters. And while Sal sat there holding the mic, they had a microphone taped to his chest, and he would read in the numbers into the microphone while I was pretending to be fixing a flat tire. And, and then for a, just went on for a long time, and we were about to leave when who shows up with the CIA? A car pulls up behind us, and two men get out, and they introduce themselves to the CIA. And uh, they, they, they looked in the car, but they, they didn't open the, the, the car door. And if they had looked into the car, if they had opened it up, they would have seen underneath a newspaper there was, there was a tape recorder. Uh, but I, I had, I, on, on the car seat, I had, I, I, I had put a tennis racket. I, I used to play tennis. And I figured this, this, this would be a good cover. You know, no one would suspect anyone playing tennis of being a commie here. Uh, <laughs> So I, I had the tape recorder there and, and, and they had the, the, the attendance where I could and, and the, the Washington Post and the, they, didn't, they didn't check any further. I think th that wouldn't happen. To, I think today they would check. Uh, it's a, it's a, it was a much less open place. And that, in and, and those days, the Pentagon was totally open to the public. Mm -hmm. I once went in there, I, w I wanted to write a story about somebody, a, a short story about somebody who placed a, a bomb at the Pentagon. 
uh, and I, I, I could walk around from floor to floor and look, in, look into rooms and, and look at uh, whatever I wanted. It was totally open. No one questioned me. Can you imagine that today? God. And, and I, I wrote this story, and then I was debating whether I should have it published. But then just, just at that very time, a real bombing of the Pentagon took place in Washington. So people in, in D.C. actually did what I was, my story was about. I figured, oh, I can't publish this now. Yes. That, was, that was the end of that story. The, the, um, the uh, incident, the, you subsequently got a, a CIA file on yourself. Where they sort of, they, they knew what you were doing, I guess. Well, or, no, or they, like, they, 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 something they didn't, yeah, they didn't know. They thought that uh, Sal was marking that, or one of us was marking down with with a pen all these numbers. They didn't see the the, the tape recorder or, or the microphone. Uh, but I forget now whether they, they actually uh, guessed. I think they, yeah, they they guessed why we were there. Yeah. They guessed there was something under the newspaper. No, they, they guessed. Yeah. No, they guessed that we were there. Looking at at the car, yeah. at the tag numbers, yeah, uh, and that this was published in the Quicksilver Times, and every few years after that, I would I would check the list to see if there was anybody I had since met or heard about, you know, but I don't think so. Uh, well, I still have that list. <laughs> um, a, a little later, we'll talk more about Sal Ferrara, but I was going to say on the, the backing up to the free press. Eventually, it uh, collapsed, it went defunct. And what, what were the main causes of that, do you think? Uh, yeah. Financial uh, well, and political. We had, we had arguments. Uh, the, the staff was split. We, we had two, two names for, for, for each other. Well, one, one, one were the politicals, and the other one were like the hippies. The, half the staff was not political enough at this point. I was I was one of the, one of the politicals, of course, and we we it, it reached such a bad state that we alternated uh, putting out issues. One issue one week would be put out by the, by the politicals, and the next week by the hippies, and and this went on for a while until finally we we just it just crashed, and well. Well, it was t well, people left one by one, and they were replaced one by one by a, ho a whole new generation of young people who were quite different from us, from the, from the founders. The, the ones who took over the paper, they were less political and much more in, into uh, drugs and, and, and sex and things like that. Uh, so it became... It became uh, a, a, a very changed newspaper, mm -hmm. and and I was embarrassed by it, uh, and it finally collapsed. And uh, when when the last when the last issue was announced, I was interviewed by Carl Bernstein of Watergate fame uh, about the paper, uh, but that that was the end of it. Mm -hmm. Was it at the Free Press when you sort of became a one-person uh, abortion counseling service? This was at the Free Press in yeah. in the How early yeah. in the early days. We had a feature story about a woman who had made it, who was very, becoming very famous because she was a champion of of of, uh, of abortion, and she spoke at our house. We invited her to speak there, and. It was a huge crowd. It was so crowded. The people were outside in, in, in the streets with, with the windows open. And I, I had no idea that abortion was such a big issue. You know, it was obviously it was. And I, I decided that I felt sorry for, for women who wanted the abortion. I, I, until then, I really didn't have much of an opinion either way. But when I heard these stories from this woman, I somehow met a doctor who performed abortions uh, in, in D.C. He was a, from Yugoslavia, and he and I formed a partnership. 
I began to get, well, people, be, women began to call the free press to find out about finding an abortion doctor because they, they after seeing the story in the paper, mm -hmm. and, and the free press began to refer these phone calls to me. I'm not sure why, but that's what happened. And I became the man to go to for abortion. And I got calls from women all over the country with, with s s such sad stories. It really broke my heart. Uh, they couldn't tell their husband, they couldn't tell their, their, their parents, this and that. And so I arranged with Dr. Vujic to, to refer these women to him. Uh, I gave, I would, well, they would call me, I would, I would give them his name and phone number and tell them that they had to bring with them $300, which at that time was a lot of money. Uh, they had to bring $300 plus a, a tampon and what have you, a few things. I, I, I told, and I told him where he lived in Silver Spring, and that was it. And he was making all this money. I never asked for a penny. <laughs> How stupid I was. Uh, until, well, finally, well, one day, a, a good friend of mine uh, w w became pregnant by a, a friend of mine, a, another guy. And I, I went to this Dr. Bush and I told him that I was the father of, of this baby, and he, he did it for nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, he was finally arrested uh, years later. Mm -hmm. I forget what happened to him, but I, I, he spent some time in jail, I guess. Mm -hmm. Maybe he was deported. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was quite an experience. So ever since then, I've had a very soft spot in my heart for, for people who need an abortion. Mm -hmm. that, that's, uh, I, I remember him when he was arrested. Yeah. Oh, yeah? When you were still at the Free Press, the March on the Pentagon, but tell us what your recollections are yeah, about that, some of the uh, That was an amazing, uh, an amazing event. Uh, uh, probably unlike anything ever happened in the U.S. before. Th tens of thousands of people marched over the bridge to the Pentagon, and we could see on, on the roof of the Pentagon there were many soldiers standing at it, uh, armed and just looking at us. And we didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, there was some violence, but not, not a great deal. Mm -hmm. uh, some, some people were arrested. And I was there all day. And uh, I, I was not arrested. But it was, it was a very exciting thing to, to, to be at. It was, there was a, a contrast, too, between many of the demonstrators. Then you had these other people in suits, like Dr. Spock. and. Oh, yeah, yeah, Ginsburg. including one of those people in suits was the, the founder of this place where we're sitting right now, mm -hmm. Marcus Raskin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Marcus Raskin and, and uh, Dr. Spock, and who was the, the author of a book on the Pentagon? Oh, Mailer. Mailer. Norman Mailer. Right. He was there. Uh, there were about, some, about five other very well-known uh, people. I think they were going to levitate the Pentagon. Was yeah, at one point, some of the, the hippie types began to levitate the Pentagon, and I, I didn't take part. I was never into that stuff, uh, but I uh, was good for laughs. Uh, and uh, it actually continued, and even the next day, when we, there were people still there, overnight. Uh, it finally came to an end, though. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, um, so when the um, free press collapsed, was it shortly thereafter you went to the Quicksilver Times? And what were the differences between the oh, two papers? Oh, well, I had been looking, well, Sal Ferreira, yeah. when he first called me, he, yeah, he said he heard that I was looking to form a new newspaper, and it, which was a fact, I mean, which, mm -hmm. Didn't didn't make me suspicious because there was a fact I was looking to find some replacement for the for the free press, and that's how we met. And he and I he he was one of the founders of Quicksilver Times, one of the writers, and we published the the, the names and addresses that we had compiled outside of the Pentagon. We published that in in, in the QT. Um, and the Pentagon? Oh, CIA. This, oh, CIA, I'm sorry, yeah. CIA. Uh, and 
he, he went with me to the various DMV offices in, in Virginia and in, and in uh, Maryland and here. And it, it, all, it all went very smoothly. Mm -hmm. uh, we would tell them that we, we this was our, fa our father's apartment building and there was someone parking there who shouldn't park and we wanted to find out who the person was and they just said, gave you all the numbers you wanted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was, what, what, what an age it was. Uh, and, and then we, we published that and, uh, and then I found out that at this time, Sal Ferreira was with the CIA. Well, well, he was an agent for them. He wasn't an, empl an employee. He was acting in their behalf. I cannot tell you now why he did what he did with me. Uh, but I f uh, Philip Agee, the former CIA officer, mm -hmm. in his, this is, how I f I f this is how I found out about Sal. I was, I was living in London in 1970-something, and I had just bought A.G.'s book and about his career at the CIA. And I was at home having dinner with his book open in front of me, and all of a sudden, I see the name Sal Ferreira, and I, I, I was so shocked. Uh, as I've written, I think, I couldn't have been more shocked if I had found out that my wife of 20 years was actually a man. Mm -hmm. It was such a shock. I just jumped out of my chair and I fell backwards across the kitchen and um, and that, well anyhow, that's, and then he, he, was, he was in Paris. He had gone to Paris after Washington and he was spying on A.G. Uh, he was pretending to be a writer for the underground uh, press. Uh, for various uh, agencies which specialized in underground newspapers and he was pulling it off and no one, no one suspected him mm -hmm. uh, until, until A.G. found out about him. Yeah. And A.G. found, did he find the uh, device? A.G. eventually did, yeah, but until then he may have been recorded uh, without, without knowing so. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Do you think do you have any evidence one way or another whether Sal, at the time you did the license plate thing at the CIA, did, do you think he was already working for the men or he got Yeah, he was later? already. Yeah. He was already. Uh, uh, he told me that he had got the idea for the license plate thing from a person at, at IPS um, who's now deceased. What's his name? Oh, Carl Hess. Carl Hess, yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's amazing how these, these names come back. Mm -hmm. And you and never confirmed that one way or another. Carl, Carl, I didn't. For uh, Carl has Carl has died not long after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were there other uh, sensitive things you did with Sal Ferrara that? Uh, well, uh, I was he, I uh, was visited by many undercover spies. They mm -hmm. posing as friends. Uh, there were four or five of them. I I had contact with. Uh, they came to my apartment and we had dinner together and things like that. Um, there were, I had a, in fact, I had a list of people I was going to ask you about yeah. in that regard. Um, there was, a, if I could just name them all, then you could ask Jan Tangen, yeah. Erwin Bach, Max Philip Friedman. Those were three. Yeah, Max Philip Friedman, he was, he was posing as a leftist to, to snare people on the left for, for years, he finally, he finally showed up uh, in testimony before a, a House committee uh, investigating the, the left and where he, he gave his, his full real name and, and he identified himself as having uh, 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 posed as a leftist to, to snare people like me. I didn't know about him until then. He, but he, his, his testimony is available in, in the House publication. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What about some of those others? Uh, uh, the other well, there was, yeah. Uh, Erwin Bach. Oh, uh, yeah. He, he, he just him. came. He actually stayed in my apartment for a couple of days. He, he told me that he, if I recall, he told me that he had been active in the 
with various unions. But it turned out he was he was not that. He was an agent. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was some other guy whom I met at a, a an anti-war meeting. And at one point, he he announced to to the to the group that we should all sign a list here so for, for, for further contact with each other. And then I. And all of a sudden, I woke up and I said, well, who are you? You know, why are you asking us to sign this list? And I asked him some questions, and his answers were not, were not very encouraging. Mm -hmm. And he, he just got up and walked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, but that time, I had learned to be suspicious more than before. Mm -hmm. We all had to learn. It was, it was a very common phenomenon. People just couldn't believe that these, pe these peaceniks could be so devious and lying. And we all had to be heard before we learned this lesson. As um, the, in your uh, book, you do talk about various uh, people that I guess were ultimately disappointments because they weren't in it for the long haul. People like Jerry Rubin. Well, yeah, Spain, well, yeah, uh, people who were not uh, Asians, at least. Yeah, I'm not, but, yeah, I'm not talking about. But that. who 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 were more interested in having fun. Like Jerry Rubin, I, I had quite a bit of contact with Jerry Rubin, mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, after meeting with him many times and doing all kinds of things with him, I still had the question in my mind: Who is Jerry Rubin? I didn't know who he really was. He, 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 when when he, when he, at one point he stopped. He became a something like he, he started a. Um, some kind of dating bureau, something like that, some something like of that nature, and and then he went into something else like that. So I, I never knew who he really was, and I wonder if he himself knew who he really was. Mm -hmm. But he was funny, and he he could get the press to pay attention again and again. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not accusing him of being any kind of no, agent. No, no, no. Him, him and Rennie Davis, his sidekick, uh, was similar. But Winnie Davis became a Maharaji type. Yeah. yeah. And then later a financial advisor to wealthy people. <laughs> he does yoga now for healthy for wealthy people. He goes out in Colorado somewhere. Yeah. But his family, I used to know a couple of his brothers, his family always said that what happened to him was that um, he lost some he lost some brain cells during one of his fasts. Fasted against the war. Really? Yeah, and um, his brother said they're shocked. They said that they, they felt the fasting had done something bad to his. But, head, but, I, I don't know but they thing. thought he he would he had he had been sincere. Yeah. I mean, he was very articulate. I mean, you know. He always played his cards close to his face. He was not a guy that shared information, but he was you know widely respected because he's such a good organizer. But I think he lost his way. Yeah. Well, some people have never had their way to begin with. Yeah. From from that time, are there uh, of your associates, are there people that you still uh, see today that you're uh, and that didn't lose their way? Uh, that, that you, uh, from the '60s, uh, the only one I'm ever in touch with is Art Grossman, who lives in D.C. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the, as I mentioned, one of the founders of, of the free mm -hmm. press. Uh, um, Frank Speltz, he, he kept insinuating that, that he was not sure that I had left the State Department. But he kept making remarks like that, which really were very annoying. And I think, in hindsight, that he was just later jealous of my whatever writing success I had. He had an ambition to be a writer, and I think he was just jealous, and he wanted to put me down. That's my uh, theory. Mm -hmm. Cause he, but he and I were really good friends. Mm -hmm. I'm really sorry that we've lost that. And he's somewhere in the Midwest, last I know. Mm -hmm. The, um, and I probably have a lot of questions too, but uh, just sort of summing up, uh, are there lessons from that period for activists today? And for that matter, what is the state of activism, particularly anti-war yeah. activities today? 
Yeah, I, I don't know if if the danger of agents is as uh, large now as it was then. I'm, I don't know. Someone who's I haven't heard any stories about uh, the the current anti-war movement being uh, taken being infiltrated by some agent. Um, I imagine there must be a few. Uh, I, I think personally there are, are as many people there's as many people against U.S. wars now as ever before, but I think they have protest fatigue. You know, if there's so many major, I think the 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 the, 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 the last straw was in 2003 when we ha we had these immense protests against the upcoming war with Iraq. Millions and millions and millions here in London and Paris. It was the most. I don't think there was any anti-war movement in, in our history which comes even close. Mm -hmm. And yet, after all this, the U.S. invaded Iraq. Anyhow, mm -hmm. they couldn't care less about the tens of millions of people who protested. And I think that that really hurt people's enthusiasm for for. for, for, for protesting there was like a, a, a coup d'etat is is there anything you see that would would bring people back I mean a new war with Syria on the ground uh, some successes mm -hmm. of, of some kind or other w would bring them back but well, what would those successes be uh, it would not be uh, electing What's his name? Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders. He, he, he has, his opinions on the war, on U.S. foreign policy, are almost on nil. I mean, he, this is a man who just a while ago referred to Hugo Chavez as that dead communist dictator. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can he be one of, part of our movement? Mm -hmm. uh, but so it, it would take someone, I mean, the, the woman who's the head of the, the, the Green Party, Stein, she, she's very good, but she has no chance of, of winning, of course. But here in the district, we get to vote for her, so... Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it would take some successes to win these people back. Something encouraging. Uh, mm -hmm. I hope that at least they learn not to be... Well, I was about to say, I hope they learn from Barack Obama, but they were, they were about to, to make the same mistake with, with Sanders. Uh, he's, he's an, or, or Clinton, even worse. Mm -hmm. I mean, she, she is a, a, a war hawk. Uh, Sanders, I don't think, is quite a war hawk. But, but people still fall in love with, with people mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, one question about that, that's always my pet peeve from those days. Activists didn't pay as much attention to the election returns. They concentrated on a movement <laughs> rather than how is this going to impact we can't be critical of Johnson because he's a Democrat, you know, this sort of thing. Is that... Uh, yeah, but they, they, they supported Bobby Kennedy a lot. Really? They, they fell in love with Bobby Kennedy the same as they do, they do with Barack Obama. Uh, Bobby Kennedy, the man who had been closely allied with the FBI and, 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 and Senator McCarthy. Yes. I mean, it's, amaz it's amazing the, the things that, that's been the, the focus of my writing a lot, to educate these pe people on the left. I, I write not to, for the people on the right so much, but people on the left. I really want to educate them and, and, and expose the myths that they live by. And that's the main function of my writing. Mm -hmm. in, in all these years, what's the thing you're most, uh, what's your, that you're proudest of that you've done? Is there any particular? Well, in my first book, which has has brought me un, un, uncounted uh, praise. It's, it's uh, Killing Hope. Uh, it, it's, it's been in, in, in print for 25 years. Uh, it's, it's been translated into t about 20 foreign languages. Uh, and it's, it, it's brought me fame and some fortune. I've been invited to speak all over the world. I spoke just two weeks ago in Moscow, uh, and it's, it's this book, which is the book. The book was translated into Russian first. That's why I was invited to speak then. Uh, so that that book has really been my coup d'état. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, I have some questions. Okay. Um, so before the internet, how did information travel? Where did you get your information from? Yeah, it took me six years to write Killing Hope. I, I could have, I didn't have a computer. I could have done it with a, with a computer. I could have done it maybe four years. Uh, but I, I didn't, I went to libraries and I, uh, the book was first written in London and I was lucky because that, that's a, f a fantastic place for libraries. They have entire buildings, one entire building devoted to Australia. And I, that, that was a, the basis of my chapter on o Australia. This, the one, one whole building and so on with every, every part of the world. So I was lucky to be there when I, when I, when I first wrote the book. Uh, but it was, that book, uh, it cost me my, my marriage, my health, and my finances, but I, it was worth it. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, I, I wrote this book in London with a wife and a young child, and it, it really, my wife, my wife she, she, she supported me politically, but I, I, I was just too absorbed in the book. What year did, did that book come out? Show the first book? edition came out in uh, 87 in London. Oh, uh, excuse me, 86, yeah. And I had moved to London with my wife and child from California in 82. And the book came out in 86. So I was wondering also about the sources for information during the time of the Washington Free Press. Sources? Also shared a space with Liberation News. Oh yeah, well, we had a we had a building at the Thomas Circle. It was a fantastic, a, a movement building. There were three three floors, and the Free Press had the entire first floor, and Liberation News Service had the entire top floor, and in between us on the second floor there was there was SDS and some other anti-war stuff. It was an amazing building. Uh, it's no wonder that the, 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 the authorities made various attempts at uh, causing us problems. Yeah, one time a circle. And what was the Liberation News Service like then? And uh, who was working there? When you were there? Well, the, the founders were there, Ma Marshall Bloom and R R Ray Mungo. Yeah, uh, I saw uh, Ray Mungo. Y years later, when I was working in California at uh, Pacifica Radio, he came into the studio and uh, I saw him for the first time in many years. It was very nice. Mm -hmm. the, um, let's see, this is off the, off the subject, but, uh, <laughs> but it does relate to DC because we ended up having lots of Chilean refugees. You essentially walked and Road buses to get. Well, I didn't to walk. I, I took across the border. I took. I, I went by bus yeah. from San Francisco to Santiago, Chile, uh, except except for one one piece going from Panama to Colombia. Mm -hmm. There was no way to to go by bus, so I, I flew that. It took about one hour. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, it was all by land, right. and it took me four months to get there. I I. I lost, I lost 25 pounds and, and a, a few thousand dollars, um, but it was a, a great experience. Yeah, it was, yeah, the walking part was just into Mexico, I guess that was the, uh, well, across the border. Oh, I walked, yeah, from California to Mexico, I, I, yeah, that's what you're thinking of maybe, yeah, but yeah. I didn't walk from San Francisco to Chile. That would have been quite a decision. yeah. But you intermittently took buses and walked. It was almost always buses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, once in a while, a, a train. Uh -huh. uh, once or twice, I, I got a car left. Mm -hmm. But it was uh, mainly buses. Mm -hmm. okay, you got to Chile after Allende was in, but before the coup. You were there in the year between. I was there for eight months, eight months. and then, and then I left. And then he, the coup came a, a few months after I left. Mm -hmm. Were you shocked at the coup or not? I was heartbroken, but it wasn't the way we expected it for a long time. Uh, two, two of my close friends there were, were killed in, in, the, in the wake of the coup. Uh, and 
the, 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 the two are, are the subject of that film, Missing. Missing. Yeah. Charles Holman. Charles Holman and Frank Teruggi, mm -hmm. whom I knew in Berkeley. When I was in Berkeley, I was writing for the, the Berkeley Bob, and I did a story on a, 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 a co-op in Berkeley, of, of which Frank was a member, and that's how I first met him. And he gave me the idea. He, he told me one day he was going to Chile. And I, th I thought, oh my God, what a great idea. And that's, that's what sent me there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. talk, could you talk a little more about Quicksilver Times and Terry Becker? Terry Becker, your, 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 your brother, right? No, it's not my brother. <laughs> <laughs> what ever happened to him? Any, any idea? I look, him around, I, look, I look around occasionally, but I can't. I have no idea. Uh, Terry Becker and, and his, yeah. Uh, I was never a fully a, a staff member, but I was a friend of Sal's who was a, who was a staff member, and I would write for them. And they, they had an office on 17th Street, and um, well, they, they were not, well, they, they were pretty good. I mean, they, they they were probably as good, as good as the free press was at, at its best, yeah. Did, did they split over the, the over politics, money, what, what, what drove them out of business? Cooks over time? Yeah, yeah. There were personal stuff, I think. Uh, they even had a fight, I think, a physical fight. Yeah, I, I wasn't there at the time, but I heard about this. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they went the way of all underground newspapers. Mm -hmm.